Has anyone told you today that you look good? If they haven't, there's probably a reason, but I want to tell you, no, it's a joke. That's a joke. You look great. You look great. I want, I want to cover a couple things before we get started today. The, the Bible says to, to give honor where honor's due. Brian Harrison, stand up for me. This guy played Judas uh, a couple years ago in our last, last Supper scene, and he's trying to get over that Judas uh, character. Everybody still thinks he's Judas. I don't think you're Judas, Brian. Teacher of the Year at James Brackenridge Middle School. I just want to say congratulations to you. <laughs> teacher of the Year. There was only two teachers in the run. The other one moved out, so he got it by default. No, I'm kidding. Great job, Brian. Proud of you, man. This coming Friday starts I Still Do Marriage Conference. It's good. We're going to start Friday evening. It's going to go Saturday morning up to about 2 o'clock on Saturday. You do not want to miss this. This is what I've learned about investments. If you invest in anything, it has a return. It could be good or bad. I believe in good returns. You can't help but invest in your marriage and not get a good return. Some of us are investing zero, zero into our marriages, and we wonder why it's so difficult. Get involved. I still do marriage conferences. It's going to be incredible. Stan Holder, his wife, Teresa, will be our special guest, and they'll be here next Sunday. Uh, they are the administrative bishops of Delmarva, and a very talented couple, and I'm excited to have them as our guest this coming weekend, but I want you to be part of that. All right, my last announcement before we get started. Are we ready? We have a new building that should be open hopefully by the 1st of November-ish. And we're going to cut that ribbon. Yeah. I was, I was telling my boss the other day, I said, when we cut that ribbon, I want it like Solomon's temple. I want, I want the smoke coming in. I want, we're going to kill a bunch of cows and we're going to sacrifice some things. One of the things that we've advertised for the building is an indoor playground for our kids. Now, here's what, here's what you got to understand. Indoor playgrounds are expensive. <laughs> expensive. Expensive. And so what we're trying to do, we're trying to stay inside our budget, and we have found a used indoor playground in Pennsylvania. It's massive. And Mike Niedemeyer has worked out an incredible deal for us, saving us almost $100,000. All right, now here's where you come in. Because he's worked such a great deal, this playground, is, it's all erected in this warehouse in Pennsylvania, and we've got to go get it. We've got to go take it down, pack it up, probably in a couple of big U-Haul trucks, and get it back to Roanoke, and then we can fabricate it to make it fit our space. So on October 8th, that Sunday, we are leaving that evening and we're going to Pennsylvania. This may be a two day, maybe three day journey. And I wanna ask a couple of well-bodied individuals who know how to use an electric drill and can pick things up, can drive, to be part of that for us. The you know, many hands make light work. A uh, few hands make your back hurt, that's what it is. Jared, stand up. I don't see Mike. This is Jared White in the back. See Jared if you want to be part of that. I would encourage as many to go. We're going to take the church van, bring some trucks while we're up there, fill them up and bring them back. Hopefully we can do it with two trucks. But when I say it's a big uh, playground, it's a, it's a big playground. I just wanted the curly slide out of it. And it's got like five big slides, and, but it's got a curly slide. And I want the curly slide. So just see Jared White or Mike Niedemeyer uh, to sign up for that. This is week three of hearing from God. We believe that God is speaking all the time. We also believe that we're not always listening. And so this is week three of, of, of kind of getting our ears open. Heard a story about this priest and he was driving his car down the road. and He noticed the car behind him swerving in and out of the lanes and 
He, he kept watching him. He was distracted by the car behind him. And the car kept going in and out and the priest kept watching him. He kept watching him. And the priest was paying more attention behind him than he was in front of him. And he runs his car off the road. He goes down an embankment and he wrecks. The drunk behind him pulls over when he sees the car go down the embankment and gets out to help the priest. When he gets down to the priest's car, he notices the collar on the priest. He said, preacher, are you okay? And the priest says, yes, son, I'm, I'm fine. And the, the drunk says, well, that was a pretty rough crash. Are you sure you're okay? And the priest says, yes, son, I'm okay. The Lord was riding with me. And the drunk goes, well, he might want to get in my car because you're going to kill him. I want to talk to you today about one word, distractions. All of us get distracted. And we get into the Word of God today, we're going to find out that the reason why a lot of us are not hearing from God is because we're not focused. We've got too much stuff around us. Too many things are going on right now. There's some of you that are sitting in this building right now. You're sitting in this sanctuary and your mind is not here. We tell all of our husbands, all of our men of the house to be where you're at. If you're sitting, in the, if you're sitting at the dining room table, have your mind at the dining room table. When our kids come into the, bill, to come into the house, put your phone down, be in the room with us. We want to remove all distractions from conversations. If you wanna do an experiment with me, do this today when you leave this place. And I pray it's not your family that somebody's doing it to you. If you go to a restaurant or you go out to eat, you can do something, just tell your family, no phones to the table. But then you watch all the other tables. You watch family sitting at a table, nobody's talking to anybody and everybody's looking at their phone. That's a distraction. These things, as helpful as they can be, they're killing our families. So you, you do the experiment. All right, listen, we're not gonna go, we're nobody taking their phone into this restaurant and we're gonna see how many tables we can pick out that Pastor Jason said are watching their phones. Now you guys won't be talking to each other because you'll be looking at other tables. But the information you pull together is gonna come back to your table for a great family discussion. You know, my, my son always tells me, Dad, don't be that guy. Dad, I, and I want to be that guy, you know. I want to tell you, don't be that family. Don't be that family that sits together, but you're not together. Don't be that family that, that vacations together, but no one's together. Be where you're at, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. Are we ready? We're going to take our text from the book of Luke chapter 8. Can we stand for the reading of God's Word? This will be the last time we stand until we point you out and call, call you out to stand. By the way, you guys know we got Teacher of the Year in this room. Are you going to get it, man? I'm proud of you. Luke chapter 8. Jesus is telling a parable about the kingdom of God. He's talking about the Word of God, he's talking about all the different minds that listen to the Word of God. He said the seed is going to hit every mind. He's going to sow seed. It's going to hit everybody's mind, but not everybody's mind is going to be the same. This is what he says. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground. And when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still, other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, he called out, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Whoever has ears to hear, we all have ears. 
He didn't, he didn't say, whoever has ears. He said, who has ears to hear? There's a difference. I saw a gentleman in the back with a shirt, read the words in red when we did Jesus Freak. These words were in red in my Bible. Jesus is speaking, so they're extremely important. And he says, I'm telling you something that you need to listen to. Open your ears. So today we're gonna to talk about distractions. Some of you guys are sitting here right now and you're thinking about something else other than being in this room. Did I leave the garage open? Did, is, is the iron still running? Did, is, is, did we feed the dog? Did someone take the dog out this morning? Because if they don't, we've got a mess and we get back. Did, you know, these are, this is where your mind is. And I wanna tell you right now, shut out all distractions. If you can give me your undivided attention for 25 minutes, it's gonna change your life. It's gonna change the way you talk to God. It's gonna change the way God talks to you because I believe God is talking. Lift your hands with me. Father, today, we declare, Lord, that you are sovereign, you are God, and you are our God. Lord, this room is full of people that are following you faithfully. There are some, Lord, that are here because they just feel as they need to be here. And there are some, Lord, that are here and not, they don't know why. Father, Lord, just reveal yourself to all of us in a mighty way. Holy Spirit, move in and out of these pews, up and down these aisles. Confirm yourself to us today. Open up our ears that we can hear your voice today. And Lord, we'll never fail to give you glory, honor, and great praise in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Before you see to tell three people, pay attention and don't get distracted. Pay attention and don't get distracted. Marvin, you're already distracted. Come on, man, stay focused. You can't, can't even sit down without being distracted. Thank you, Cord. And did the band and worship team do a great job today? There are two extremes. There are people who say that God doesn't speak at all, and there are some that say God speaks all the time. I'm one of these people that I do believe God is trying to speak all the time, but I don't believe he's speaking in everything I'm doing. If a leaf falls on my windshield and gets stuck on my windshield wiper, I don't stop the car and say, God, what are you saying to me? I turn the wipers on and move the leaf and I keep moving. But then there are times where God is speaking. Sometimes he'll speak through somebody else to me. Sometimes he'll speak through things to me. Sometimes he'll just speak to my spirit. I've never heard God speak in an audible voice. Never. I've heard people say they have, and I've just, you know, I know when, when Moses had an encounter with God, it changed his appearance when he saw God. He just saw the backside of God. So when we talk about God speaking God can speak to us in many different forms in many different ways. The question is, are we listening? In Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I've shared this with, with you that I learned with the scripture to work it backwards. I have to know the word of God and what it says, then my faith rises. Sometimes I'm so repetitive, people are like, hey, he says it all the time. He says, because I'm trying to work it. I tell you all the time that you are blessed coming in and blessed going out. I tell you all the time, you're the head and not the tail. Why do I say that? Because the word of God says that. Sometimes I've got to remind myself I'm the head and not the tail. Because the devil wants to make me feel like I'm the tail. And he will put me in situations so I gotta remind myself of the word of God. Jason, you're the head and not the tail. That's what the Bible says. And when I do that, all of a sudden my faith rises. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. I've gotta remind myself the promises of God. Just to give you a little um, infomercial, I'm working on something really good. Hopefully I'm gonna get it to you by the end of the year, but it's a sermon series entitled Keep the Receipts. Because if God said it, I got the receipt. 
His word's not going to return void. In this parable in Luke chapter 8, there are three major components you've got to pay attention to. There is the farmer, there is the seed, and then there is the soil. These are the, these are the three things that are in all four of the situations. The farmer is God. The seed is the word of God. The soil, believe it or not, is your mind. Some would say your attitude towards the word of God. That the God is planting or sowing his word onto you. The question is, how do you receive the word? He said, he said some fell by the path where it was trampled on, where the enemy has trampled and made, made the mind hard. I don't want to receive, I don't want religion. I don't want to receive your mess. I don't want to be that. I, you know, and the mind is hard. And then he said the birds came and ate it, ate all the seed. There was no seed around this mind. He said the other one, the seed, the seed was received with joy, but it wasn't enough water for the seed to grow, and it was shallow. Today, he's telling us that seed fell on the soil, and when it, when it began to grow, the thorns grew with it. The weeds grew with it. And it says that the thorns choked the good seed that was growing, and it, it made it not produce fruit. Think about this. If this is you, which we have some in here, with this many people, we've got to have some in here, that you receive the word and it's growing in you. It's there. It's trying to produce fruit for the kingdom. But there's things in your life called distractions that are choking it out of you. God wants to do something great through you, but the enemy has planted weeds around you and choking out the fruit. It doesn't mean I don't want to know the word. It doesn't mean I don't want to follow God. That's not what it's saying. It's saying that some things in your life are hurting you for being all that you can be. There are four types of soil, but there are also four principles to preparing yourself to hear from God. With a show of hands, I'm going to do a quick survey, and I want you to look around, around people that are sitting close to you. If they don't raise their hands, I want you to point them out. <laughs> Who in this house would not want to hear from God? Right. Who in this, that was a trick question. Who in this house would want to hear from God? Look at this, all of us. All of the creation is waiting with bated breath for the creator to speak. Some of us don't even know our purpose because we don't know his voice. He's been trying to talk to us, communicate with us, but we have so many distractions, the enemy's working against us. All right, so look, here, here's the four principles to preparing yourself to hear from God. And we've covered two of these. Number one, you want to cultivate an open mind. If, if, if the word of God is going to be sown onto my soil, I want to make sure I have the soil ready to receive the word. I want to cultivate the soil. Number two, I want to allocate time to listen. I've got to set time aside to listen when God is speaking to me. I can't be so busy that I can't hear him. Number three, you want to eliminate distractions from your time with God. And that's where we are today. We're, we want to eliminate distractions from our time. And then my last one will be, when he does speak, cooperate fully when God speaks to you. So I'm going to take this drink of water. This is going to help me. It's going to help me help you. Are we ready? Here's where we're going. Eliminate distractions from your time with God. Have you ever been trying to pray and you couldn't just get your mind set on it? You're worried about something else? You know, oh, so and so's coming over, but I got to pray, but I, did, I, did, I, did I vacuum? Oh, the bathroom's clean. 
Uh, what does the front yard look like? Those kids, ah, those kids. And you're, you're trying to focus on God, but there's other things in your mind that are playing pickleball in your mind. This is how it reads. In, in Luke chapter 8, verse 7, Jesus says, Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Notice it said it grew up with it, that the seed that was planted was growing. Okay? The word of God was growing, but it was being choked. That tells me that, hey, we're trying to do this. We're trying to walk this walk. We're, we're trying to obey the word of God. We're, we're trying, but something's fighting against us. And so the disciples said, Lord, we don't fully understand what you're saying. Can you water this down for us? Can you simplify this for us? Could, could you give it to us in layman's terms, what you're talking about? And we flip down to verse 14 and he does it for him. Look at what Jesus says about this verse. He says, now the ones that fell along the thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with, with cares, riches, and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. Notice it didn't say it doesn't bring fruit. It said it doesn't bring fruit to maturity. There's fruit starting, but it never matures. There, there's, there's these things that, that you're doing for God that it starts off great, but you can't finish it. You're not, you don't have a closer. You, can't, you, you start a good game, you talk a good game, but when it comes down to it, you fail every time because you're being choked. The soil with the weeds represents a preoccupied mind. I heard a story this week, and I, I'm going to try to give it to you the way I saw it in my mind. I read the story. And I, back before we had the telephone for long-distance calls, they used this thing called a tele, telegraph. And they used Morse code. And, I think that's it. See, if you pause like that, people think you're really doing something, but you're not. You're just making it up. <laughs> but this company was trying to hire somebody who knew how to do the telegraph. And so they did this ad in the newspaper. If, if, if you're skilled in this area, we want you to bring your resume and come to this address. So this one gentleman, he wants the job. So he, he gets his resume together. He goes to the address that was advertised. He walks in, and the room is full of people dressed like he is, holding a resume. And there is a sign on the desk. It says, fill out this form, have a seat. And when, when, you hear your, when you hear yourself called, just come on back to the office. This is what here, play my video. This is what, this is what he walked in. He's sitting there, everybody's sitting down. He's waiting for his name to be called. He's the last guy there. There's about 20 guys ahead of him that were already there. He sits down for about five minutes. He gets up. He walks to the back office, and the door shuts. All the other people in the room are like, what in the world? His name wasn't called. We've been sitting here. He's the last guy. What? Did we miss something? About 10 minutes later, that gentleman comes out with the ball. And they're walking and laughing to the front door. And the ball shakes his hand and says, I'll see you Monday at 8 o'clock. And the ball turns around and tells everybody else, guys, we want to thank you for coming out today. Uh, the job has been filled. Thank you. Have a good day. And all the other candidates are like, wait a minute. We didn't get a chance. So one brave soul, one brave soul, you kill it. One brave soul says to the boss, that's not fair. We've been sitting here for over an hour. He, he's been here five minutes, and he, he walks to the back. You didn't call any of our names. You didn't, you, didn't, you didn't interview any of us. We didn't have a chance to tell you what we could do. That's not fair. And the boss says, let me tell you what's not fair. He said, I ask all you guys to do the same thing. Hit, hit, the, hit it again. He said, I ask all you guys to do the same thing. He said, you're here to apply to the telegraph. He said... What I've been telegraphing to all you guys for an hour simply says, if you can hear this, if you hear this, come on back. The job is yours. Come to the back office. He was the only one who heard it. 
You've been sitting here an hour. What does that mean? That means God is always speaking, but we're caught up with all the noise of the office of life. And God is telegraphing to you, I want to use you in a mighty way. I want to use you in a mighty way. I want to use you in a mighty way. I've got big plans for you. I've got a destiny for you. And you're sitting there saying, it's not fair. You, you, want, you want this booming voice from God, but God has been speaking the whole time. Why can the creation not hear the creator? It's not our fault. There's an enemy fighting against us, trying to block the voice of God in your ears. And this is what he said. He said, in that weed grows up, the thorn grows up with the seed, and it chokes it out with the cares of this life. And we get more worried about life than we do the life giver. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 35, the apostle Paul said this, and this I say for your own profit, not that I may put a leash on you, but, but for what is proper, and that you may serve the Lord without distraction. That you may serve the Lord without distraction. I went back and read the whole chapter. <laughs> All right, you guys ready for something really funny? Paul is really saying here, He's saying, if you're single, stay single. He said, because when you're single, your mind is focused on God. He said, he said now if you're burning with lust, he said, get married. He said, but when you get married, you're going to get distractions from your spouse. And you won't be all you can be for God. He said, stay single. If you can't stay single, get married, but know that you're going to be distracted. How many knows that uh, first comes love, second comes marriage, then comes somebody with a baby carriage? Once you, once you get married, that's one distraction. Once you start having kids, that's another distraction. Then you start having grandkids, that's another distraction. What Paul is saying is, he goes, I'm trying to keep distractions out of your life. Because God wants to do something big in you. Now, if you're married, do not tell your spouse, this is over, I want to do something for God. Don't do that. You're already married. The definition of distraction is this. A drawing apart separation. That which diverts attention or a diversion, a thing that prevents someone from giving full attention to something else. A, a distraction can be anything, anything that pulls your attention. As I'm talking, I want, to, I want you to think about what are the distractors in your life? You're sitting in the house of God today, but are you really here? Is your mind here? Have you been thinking about other things during the service? If you have, you're distracted. Thorns are choking you. That you're in the house of God and still can't pay attention. That's tough. That means the enemy has a hold of you. It doesn't mean you're possessed by a demonic spirit, but it does mean that the, that the, that the, the demonic spirits are manipulating the way you're thinking. My mother always told me that your mind is the devil's playground. If you let him play there, he'll stay there. I want you to remember this, activity and productivity are not synonymous. Just because you're active, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean you're productive. I struggle with people that just look busy, but they get nothing done. Sweat like crazy, but get nothing done. When my older boy, Noah, was younger, played a lot of baseball, and uh, Jarrett was at the time, he was coaching at Liberty and Noah was going to, wanting to go to Liberty, committed to Liberty and we were working out and, and Jarrett told Noah this, he said, it's not about quali, qual, he said, it's not about quantity, it's about quality. He goes, you can spend an hour in that batting cage and still get nothing done. 
He said, but if you're in there for 10 minutes, be productive. If you, if you only have 10 minutes, get 10 minutes. If you're gonna work out, don't work out and just stand and talk to people. If I only got 10 minutes, get out of my way. I got 10 minutes, you are slowing me down. I'll call you later when I'm sitting at the desk. Activity is it's not the same as productivity. There are three weeds that Jesus talks about here in scripture. He said there was worry, riches, and pleasures. Worry, riches, and pleasures. Let me talk to you about worry real fast. I remember a while back reading a statistic about worry. It said that we worry about 92% of the things we worry about never come to fruition. But we wasted time worrying about it. Here's my philosophy is, I'll worry about it when it lands on my door. If it's something I think it's, it's got teeth, I'm gonna take care of it early. But if I can't control it, the serenity prayer, if you guys ever seen the serenity prayer, it says, Lord, help me to handle the things I can handle. Help me to let go of the things I can't handle, but Lord, also help me to know the difference. Because I'm trying to handle things I, can't, I shouldn't be handling. I'm, trying to, I'm worried about things I have no control over. Stop worrying. Worrying, is a, is a, it's got its hands around your neck. I bought an old truck one time. And I bought that truck on a great deal because when you put your foot in the throttle, it would not go over 45 miles an hour. And so the guy sold it to me for a great price. I said, man, I'm not taking your truck for that price. He said, listen, Jason, if you can fix it, you got a great truck. If you can't fix it, it's yours. Don't bring it back over here. You know? And so I'm driving that truck around. It, it would get from zero to 45 pretty quick. But when it got to 45, I put my foot all the way down in the throttle and it just wouldn't go anywhere. So I rolled the windows down. You know, my shop teacher always told me, listen, listen to your car. Your car's talking to you, listen to it. And so I rolled the windows down and I'm listening to this thing, man. This is like, you know, now that's 45 right there. And I'm like, there's a difference between 35 and 45. Sharp knife cook here is figuring this out. Yeah. But it sounded like somebody had its hands around its neck or over its mouth. And it wasn't breathing. So I called my mechanic and I said, listen, this is what I think. But I don't have the time. Could you look at this? He drove it too. He said, he said Jason, it's not breathing right. I said, I told you that, Sherlock. He cuts off, believe it or not, he cuts off the catalytic converters. And that thing got loud and it took off. I mean, it, it would throw your neck into the, into the bed of the truck. The catalytic converter had collapsed. And when the exhaust was coming through, it wasn't allowing it to go through it because it was collapsed. And the truck was trying to, trying to exhale, but it was like somebody was covering its mouth and it wasn't breathing. And I thought, it's the same thing that Jesus is saying here. That I've received the word of God. It's growing in me, but I can't, I can't exhale. I can't do what he's designed me to do because somebody's got their hand over my mouth. They got their hands around my neck. It's the thorns, it's, it's worry, it's stress. Somebody here is dying a slow death in your mind because you're allowing worry, riches, and pleasures to take precedent over what your creator's trying to talk to you about. And you worry about things that he can handle quickly, but you're not listening to the one who can handle it quickly. When, when, when as a parent, you understand, Susan and I are just, we're weird parents, okay? We're, we're parents that we just expect first time obedience. And if you don't get that, you, you pretty much beat it into the child that you will listen the first time. <laughs> now, oh, don't call social services. <laughs> we believe in first-time obedience. There are things, there, there are teaching tools that we use for our children to help them understand that mom and dad are serious. You know, if I, I, if I ask you to stop doing something, I want you to stop when I say stop. I'm not going to count to three. I'm stepping over this seat on one. 
okay? And when you step over seat on one, you'll never get to two. That's a cool thing, I'm telling you. If you respond on one, mom, dad, you'll never get to two with the countdown. But if you get to three and don't do anything, go ahead and count to 10. It ain't going to happen. This is the three R's to active listening. And this is what has helped our children be great listeners. There are three R's to active listening. Number one is repent, I mean repeat. Number two is reflect. And number three is respond. We taught our kids to repeat to us what we just told you. Swisher, once you take that rake, once you go in this backyard, once you rake all these leaves up in the pile right here, what did I just tell you to do? You tell me to go out back and do some things and sow a bunch of leaves. That's not what I told you. I want you to take this rake in that backyard, rake all these leaves up into a pile right here. Tell me what I told you. Uh, you may go in the back with a rake and put a bunch of leaves in a pile. That is not what I told you. Take this rake. And until he could repeat it, I wasn't leaving. His repeating to me what I told him lets me know he heard me. It's active listening. If your kid can't repeat to you what, what you've told him, keep telling him. That's why I heard this one preacher. He was fairly new at this church, and he was preaching. He preached a, he preached a paint off the walls the first Sunday. Everybody shouted. The next Sunday he came back, he preached it again. Same message. They didn't shout as much, but they, they shouted. It was a good message. Week three, he preached the same message. Week four, same message. Finally, the elders came. Listen, preacher, you preached the same message four weeks in a row. Is that all you got? He said, that's all I got till you listen to me. He said, I'm going to keep preaching until you do it. You keep telling your kids, tell me what I ask you to do. I do that sometimes with employees. Here's what I need you to do. It's important. Just tell me back what I just told you. And they'll say, if, I, if I mess the order up, no, 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 that's not the order. Here's the order. Because I can't be there. It's got to be done right. That's like trying to give somebody a combination lock number, and you just throw three numbers at them. Just use those three whenever you want. But you don't put them in the right order, you're not going to open the lock. Repeat, reflect, respond. I'm going to close with this. I'm going to give you six points on how to defend against distractions. How do I defend my mind against the distractions of the enemy? We ready? Number one, realize you're in a spiritual battle. If you're trying to pray, you're trying to hear from God, if you cannot focus, it is not God bringing distractions to you. It is the enemy. You've got to realize that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities, spirits. If that's too freaky for you, you're going to have a hard time in heaven. This is a spiritual battle. This is spiritual warfare when I'm trying to pray and I can't focus. What do I do, pastor? You turn on some worship music. I'm going to flood the atmosphere with the praises of God. If I don't have worship music, I'm going to go to my Valley Church app and hit this week's service. Corey, bring me into the, bring me into the throne room. Get my mind focused. And just play the, play the service. Just turn it up. But get your mind focused. Set the atmosphere for spiritual warfare. So you have to first recognize if you cannot focus, it's a spiritual matter. Number two, take a warrior stance. You can't fight without a warrior stance. If I came down there and I slapped you in the face, I took my right hand, which is my dominant hand, and I came across your jaw about one time, hard. I probably don't have to do that twice to get your attention. I know for me, you slap me one time, you got my undivided attention. And I'll tell you what, I'm probably not gonna stay seated either, okay? I'm gonna be up trying to figure out what you just did and why you did that, but I'm not gonna let you do it again. A warrior stance is a stance, it's a fighting stance. You don't put your feet together. Well, you, if you do, you ain't gonna be a warrior long. <laughs> My football coach taught me this. He said, you got one of two choices on this football field, Jason. You can be a hammer or you can be a nail. 
He goes, the hammer's gonna do the hitting and the nail's gonna get hit. And let me give you some advice, son. The nail's gonna get hurt all the time. He said, if you don't wanna get hurt, you do the hitting. But if you wanna get hurt, just walk around this field like you don't know what's going on. And someone's gonna, someone's gonna drive your nail. A warrior stance is an aggressive stance. And when I realize in my prayer time that I can't get focused and I realize it's spiritual warfare, I've got to get a warrior stance. I've got to talk to God. I've got to hear from God. And if I'm not, there's a reason why I'm not. The enemy doesn't want you to hear what the Lord is saying to you. So you've got to get so mad about it. I'm not mad. I'm just passionate. Number three, you've got to remember Remember that the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony is how you conquer your enemy. You cannot forget where God has brought you from. If God has brought you out of something, you gotta be able to tell that story because that's your story. It's not somebody else's story, that's your story. If God has blessed my marriage from a, from a pit, I'm gonna tell you about it. If God has raised my kids out of some funk, I'm gonna tell you about it. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, it says, and they overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. That's how they overcame. I didn't do it by myself. The blood of the lamb helped me, but my testimony assures my position in the blood. Hmm. Realize you're in a spiritual battle. Number two, take a warrior stance. And number three, remember the blood of the lamb and your testimony. And number four, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse 17 says, pray. Paul said, pray without ceasing. When I was a younger man, that didn't make sense to me. I, there's no way I can pray without ceasing. That's really not what he's telling you to do. Jason, can I talk to you and I'm praying right now and I'm praying? Jason, you've been praying for 24 hours. Can I talk? No, I'm just praying, I'm praying. What he's saying, keep your mind in a place where you're constantly communicating with God. My little boy Swisher's wearing those wristbands, WWJD, what would Jesus do? I think I said, like, whatever, I may have the initials wrong, but what would Jesus do? If we were those back in the late 80s, back when I was in preschool. But he wears that. It's a reminder in this moment, what would Jesus do? I'm, I'm, always, I'm always in that mindset, what would Jesus do? What, 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 what would a child of God do? What, what would a follower of Jesus do in this situation? I pull out on 81 and somebody thought I got into my lane too quick. They tell me I'm number one. Well, what would Jesus do? Jesus would let him have the lane. It's not worth it. We're all going the same direction anyway. I'll pass you when I get about a mile up when I drop this hammer. What I'm saying to you, to pray without ceasing, is to have your mind always about God. You're going, to, <laughs> Pastor, do you really do? You're going through a drive-thru at the fast food restaurant. Well, what would Jesus eat? Well, he wouldn't eat that triple quarter. <laughs> you know. What would he do? Pray without ceasing, which means prayer is communication with God. Prayer is speaking. And prayer is listening. So that means I'm always in that mode, praying without ceasing. I'm always listening. I'm always asking. Mm. Number five, turn away from distractions. Turn away from distractions. I heard a story about this guy. He was like in New York City. He needed to make a phone call. So he goes into this phone booth, leaves the door open, and he calls his friend. And it's all this traffic horns beeping, people screaming, all kind of stuff. And his friend's like, what? What? I'm going to be there at six o'clock. I need a ride. What? What? I can't hear you. And all he was hearing on the other end of the phone was all the noise outside the phone booth. All the man had to do was close the door to the phone booth. And all the noise would have stayed outside. How, how do you eliminate distractions? You shut the door. Jesus says, when you come to me, come into your prayer closet. Shut the door. Leave all the distractions outside. I don't know if you do this, but I challenge you and I double dog dare you to do it. 
Pick a time during the day where you separate yourself from all the craziness and just go into a prayer closet. Your prayer closet could be the front seat of your car. It could be a back desk at the office. It could be a parking lot you walk around to get away from everything, but you're getting rid of distractions. Get rid of the distractions. Lord, I wanna hear from you. I wanna hear my voice speak to you. My mind wants to hear my, my mouth declare your glory. My ears hear so many things, but Lord, I want to hear my own mouth declare your greatness. And number six, stay focused. Stay focused. Sheep are probably the dumbest animals on the planet. They are. We are, refer, refer, we are referred to as sheep in the Bible because we're not very bright. And we think we're bright, but when you, would you, if you could remove yourself from your situation, elevate about 30,000 feet where you could look down on your whole situation and you could see everything and realize you made a poor decision there. You didn't take, it, take into advantage everything around, but you're at a different angle now. I see it different because we're dumb. In 2005, the Washington Post wrote a story about shepherds that, that they had interviewed from Turkey. And these one shepherd said, they said, one time we watched one sheep lead the flock of sheep to a cliff. And that, sh that one sheep fell over the cliff. And we watched 400 other sheep go over that cliff. And the reporter's like, what? He said, well, it was more than that. We had 400 sheep die that day that went over that cliff. But we had 1,100 more go over after that 400. And we couldn't get there fast enough because they just kept going over the cliff. And the reporter, said, the reporter said, but you only had 400 die? And they said, yeah, the first 400 that hit died. And the ones that came out there, the ones that were dead broke their other ones fall. And we salvaged most of them but we couldn't get there because they kept going over the cliff. They weren't focused. A sheep that was focused would have said, man, I just saw 400 of you jokers go over there. But they weren't focused. And that is exactly what we do. With all the cares of life choking us out, we make poor decisions. I don't know when was the last time you had a tough decision and you actually asked God, what should I do here? Lord, I need some wisdom. The Bible says he who lacks wisdom is to ask for wisdom and, and he will give you wisdom if you ask. Lord, I got a situation with a coworker. I don't know how to handle this person. They're crazy. Lord, I need wisdom. Do I talk to them? Do I not talk to them? Do I, what do I do? And let the Holy Spirit work through you. In Isaiah, Chapter 53, verse 6, Isaiah said, We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned to his own way. We are sheep. I want to thank you for being attentive today. I know your mind has wrestled against distractions. For some of you, you have been talking to people outside this room already while you're sitting in this room. You've texted people You've alerted people, you've checked emails, you've probably looked at your phone. Listen, I'm not upset about that. I'm gonna tell you right now, that doesn't bother me. It should bother you. I'm gonna be the same person walking out of here. If you can't focus, you're gonna be the same person walking out of here. God wants to do something big in your life. Let me share this last scripture with you. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, the Apostle Paul said this. He says, Be anxious in no for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. There's one word in here that always bothered me because I really didn't fully know the definition of it, but I want to show it to you. Supplication. Suppl what? He says, he says in, but with, in everything with prayer and supplication. What is supplication? So I looked it up for you, in case you have that question. Supplication means to ask or to beg. 
asking or begging. So I'm going to read this to you again with the definition in it, okay? When we pray, this is how we pray. He says, be anxious about nothing, but in everything by prayer and asking and begging. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. God is telling us, he said, ask me for it. Beg me for it. And then thank me for it. You notice that? By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Lord, it's Jason again. And you know this situation, and Lord, I'm begging you, pleading with you to turn this thing around. I need you to do it today, Lord. I need you to make a way where there's no way. I, ne- I need you to do what man says cannot be done. I need you to do it. And now, Lord, I'm gonna thank you for it because I know you're good for it. I wanna praise you in advance for what you're doing. That's how Paul said to pray. Pray with asking and begging and thanksgiving. Stand with me. He said, let your request be made known to God. I don't know if you know this, but God wants to hear from you. God wants to help you. And sometimes we don't even know how to help ourselves. Here's the best best self-help advice you could get. Pray. Just pray. Pray. When you pray, you are showing humility. Number one, recognizing I can't do this. Number two, you're acknowledging the one you're asking that can. That's why you're asking. It's a level of faith. And then I praise him in advance. and I tell him thank you for the blessings on the way. Here's where we are. At the close of this service, you're gonna walk out of here. You got one of two choices. You can be the same person that walked in or you can be somebody different. My prayer is that when you leave this place, you leave encouraged, you leave with knowledge that God does want me to ask. He even wants me to beg, but he wants me to thank him for it. When Paul said that in Philippians, he didn't say the prayer was even answered. He said, he said, pray, beg, ask, thank you. God's gonna answer in his timing. But every time I pray, I say, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Number one, for hearing my prayer. Number two, for allowing me the opportunity and the privilege to speak to you today. And that your ear would hear my voice. Thank you, Lord. But you got to fix Susie. You know, you got to fix these kids. I'm begging you. There's somebody in this house today that you're dealing with real problems. And you need God to answer prayer. My question to you is, have you asked him? Have you begged him? I heard a preacher say one time, he said, there's a difference between prayer and burning prayer. He said, your kid strikes out, your kids come up to bat again, he struck out twice and you're praying, oh God, just let him get a hit. God, let him get a hit. But if that same kid gets diagnosed with, diagnosed with leukemia, your prayer changes. Oh God, I need you to move. I don't care about a hit. I don't care about striking out. I need his life saved. We need to turn our prayer to burning prayer. Lord, hear my voice. Jared, I want you to come and be ready. Corey, I want you to to sing and play a song. We'll get ready to close this service, but I I feel there's a need for prayer. And last week, we had a traffic jam out front. I'm trying to fix that too. I'm gonna gonna pray. Jared's gonna come and close this out. I'm gonna stay in the altar here today. If you need prayer, if you need something, I want, to, I want to pray with you. I want the prayer team to stay with me if you can. Corey's going to sing us out when, when Jared's finished. I want to thank you for being here today. 
If you're visiting with us, welcome to Valley Church. If you're looking for a church home, this is it. We just got to get to know you a little bit better, okay? Be around. Lift your hands with me. Father, today, Lord, I thank you, Lord, for the time you've given us to come together. Lord, I pray, Lord, that we take distractions, we remove them far away from us. We bind the hands of the enemy out of our minds, and we loose faith. We loose the word of God over us. Let the seed fall on this soil, Lord. We will not, we will not let our fruit fall to the ground before it's time. And we will not allow the enemy to choke it out of us. Father, to you be glory and honor and great praise. In Jesus' mighty name, and everyone said, amen. 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 Go ahead and give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Just one quick announcement, as Pastor had mentioned, we are going to be going up in a couple weeks to pick up some playground equipment. So uh, if you are interested and have some time and can and make that trip with us and help us out, I'm going to be standing around up here in the front. I've got a clipboard. I just want to collect your information. So if you're interested in spending those couple days helping us out with that, if you will just uh, stick around and sign up for that, and I'll be reaching out to you shortly. But please share with me in our benediction. Psalm 19, verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. God bless you guys. Have a great day.